Thank you, thank you. Thank you, oh, that was nice. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming to my session. My name is uh, Rich Vorwaller. I am the uh, Chief Product Officer at uh, Cloud Storage Security, or CSS, as we like to call it. Uh, super excited today. We're gonna talk about a new release we just did. We call it kind of GNAI Secure on how to protect your uh, workloads uh, in AWS. But before I do that, I'm gonna go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So indulge me here on this. If you don't like it, to be candid, marketing made most of this, and I'm just up here kind of reading it, so bear with me, give me a little bit of slack in the survey when you do that. What I wanna talk about, I wanna talk a little bit about who we are. I'm assuming many of you haven't heard of us. We're a new uh, startup in cloud security. You know, what's our product journey has been, and then I wanna talk about the release that we did for AWS Reinforce on protecting Gen AI models today. So here's my little rabbit hole. Um, has anybody ever heard of the uh, ship of feces? Is that, anybody heard this? Uh, oh, awesome, all right, good. I'm glad I'm, I'm, glad I'm not alone. Um, if you haven't heard about the ship of feces, it's a thought experiment that has kind of this paradoxical uh, uh, circular thought process. I'm totally expecting Christopher Nolan to make a movie about this one day, so you'll see it. But essentially the story is, it's this Greek mythology story where the hero, Theseus, goes off, he rescues some children from a minotaur, he comes back, and to commemorate his victory, they say, hey, we're gonna maintain your ship. So we're gonna dock your ship in Athens, and every year we're gonna look at it, and if, if we need to repair it, like a plank or maybe the sail or things like that, we're gonna keep this ship in pristine order. So it really kind of creates this kind of paradoxical thought of like, well, if we're re replacing things, at what point does it become something new? Or is it really kind of the original ship of feces? Or is it that as you start to replace things, it becomes something kind of completely new? There's this other kind of really interesting rabbit hole where it's like, well, if we kept all the old planks and then we use that to rebuild the ship again, you know, is that the original ship of feces or is it something new? So I won't go too much farther down the rabbit hole, but the reason why I share this is it really kind of has this nice analogy of why we started cloud storage security and really what the problem we were trying to solve. So our founders in CSS, they came from very well-known established cybersecurity vendors, probably solutions that you're using today in your environment. And when they looked at, out kind of at the needs of cybersecurity in AWS, they saw kind of two approaches to it. One was this, hey, let's just kind of rebuild the old ship, where you had a lot of endpoint vendors that were taking their technology and just kind of making it work in AWS. So it was like, hey, let's take our agent, let's just kind of make it work, we'll adapt it, and just kind of rebuild that plank by plank ship. So they saw a lot of problems with that deployment of pro process. You know, one was it was highly focused on protecting compute resources. There wasn't a lot of solutions protecting, you know, uh, cloud storage or databases. Two, um, it really kind of, you know, had some operational challenges with deploying agents. So if you've, you've walked the floor today, you've probably seen a lot of vendors pitching agentless solutions. And there is a lot of overhead and a lot of management pain with deploying solutions, especially in the cloud. You know, the third was, it was just, it, it was really just kind of this rebuilding what we already had. And it was this thought of you're really not taking advantage of the new technologies that the cloud offer. The other approach that they saw, which they thought was interesting, was we call this kind of the SaaS approach, which is, okay, you don't have to run an agent, you don't have to run anything in your environment, but you need to give us API access to things like your block storage or your EBS snapshots or your objects in S3. And as we see those objects getting written, we're gonna copy them over, move them over across the public internet. Then we will scan them in our platform and come back with a verdict. Well, that, to be honest, just felt insane to the founders. They're like, why would we have to give you our crown jewels for you to tell us that they are the crown jewels. The uh, example we always talk about internally is like, you know, if there's a crime scene, you don't pick up the crime scene and move it over to the police station, right? You have the investigation happen where it took place. And so that was fundamentally important to us. We felt that the solution that we needed to provide 
shouldn't be based on old technology. It shouldn't require the customer to move their data over to our infrastructure. So we felt like this was a tipping point for us where we really needed to start from scratch and kind of build a new ship. And that's exactly what we did. So the solution that we offer today is it doesn't require any kind of external connections. It's not a SaaS service. It's a completely kind of in-tenant solution that you run in your environment. And the reason we did that was if you look at kind of the well-architected framework, there is a security advantage within accounts. You know, there's a reason why AWS recommends you have multiple accounts and you divide up your workloads into those accounts because there's a security border and there's a, a containment within the blast radius at that account level. And we felt that was very sacred. We felt that was a line that we didn't want to cross and we want to maintain for our customers. Now, we knew that we would have to do something to actually provide you know, threat intelligence updates and things like that. So we leverage a concept of what we call private mirrors where it doesn't require you to do an external connection. You can actually through um, either kind of a NAT gateway or some kind of routing mechanism pull that in at your discretion so that you're not, have to, you're not forced to make that external connection. The other scenario that we said was like, all right, we, we know we're going to have to run something in the customer's environment to do the types of protections that they're going to need to do, but let's make that as touchless and as lightweight as possible. So our solution is built on a serverless stack. We use ECS, Fargate task, and then we leverage the native services in AWS, like SNS, SQS, DynamoDB, and something uh, around those lines for you to kind of deploy that solution. Uh, we literally give you kind of, I would say, two pieces of code. We give you a CloudFormation template, we give you an ECR image, and with those pieces, you're literally kind of going to build up this protection stack in your environment, and it typically takes our customers anywhere from like five to six minutes to do that. We have broad support for AWS. Again, we saw a huge missing niche in storage, so not only does it support S3, but we're going to do things for EBS, EFS, NXX, FSX, any kind of storage service that ends with X, we probably cover that, all right? And we would support both kind of this inbound and outbound data transfer. So what, what is that? For us, that is if you're accepting data, like if you're bringing in data from either a third party or you're migrating that over to AWS, we'll support that use case. But we also wanted to make sure the reverse was true. If your application is producing data or if you're feeding data over to some other kind of system, we wanted to make sure that you had coverage in both of those scenarios. So that's what we call kind of our inbound, outbound protection. And I'll talk a little bit later about that with our GNAI protection. So it's been, you know, to be, to be transparent, it's been a phenomenal experience for us. We launched CSS in 2020. We had a, you know, a, a very uh, focused approach for malware protection on S3. And from there, we have just grown. Uh, we then kind of branched out into static and dynamic analysis for malware as well as data classification. We've been able to participate in a whole bunch of AWS competency programs as well as support for different regions. Uh, last year, we came out with data loss prevention for S3, and then we've also expanded that to the other storage services. And then this year, we're excited to announce our support for Gen AI protection, which, we're calling Gen, uh, which we are calling Gen AI Secure. And I'm going to talk about that here. So it's been a phenomenal experience for us. We've just had some great customer interaction and uh, we're excited to present that with you today. So let me kind of talk about, I'm going to do a very, very high level, here's how we kind of deploy in a customer's environment, just to show you the simplicity of it, and then I'll talk about what we're doing for Gen AI. So we're, we have different kind of deployment models and scan models, but the main one that we see a lot of our customers do is kind of a, an event-based approach to scanning. So this is where I have an S3 bucket, maybe this is a public-facing bucket, maybe it's just a bucket that I've um, you know, uh, uh, configured to allow kind of incoming data connections. As those objects get dropped into the bucket, we're going to kick off a pipeline approach with SNS and SQS that basically tells us, hey, a new object has hit the bucket. Here's the prioritization to scan that and just kind of queue up that uh, within the, the customer's environment. From there, what we're doing is we're kicking off an ECS Fargate task where we will take our multiple scanning engines so we are big believers in you want to have several verdicts on a file. 
You don't want to rely just on one. So we have integrations with like CrowdStrike, uh, uh, Sophos. We also have some open source tools like with Clam AV. So we're allowed to give you a verdict on those objects from multiple sources and not just one. As that task gets kicked up in Fargate, we'll then scan those objects. And at that, to be at that stage, you could probably quit. We do have some customers that just do this. They allow us to tag the information and then it's up to them to, you know, whether or not to do that. But one of the common things we see our customers do is kind of an isolation or quarantine flow where they'll take those malicious objects, they're tagged, and then they'll actually give us the IAM policies to move that into a quarantine bucket to do some kind of forensics analysis of how did it get in my environment, what does it do, how do I remediate that. What we've done now with our Gen AI Secure Launch is we've done an integration with Amazon Bedrock. And again, this is completely hosted in your environment, so you have control over both the management plane and the control plane. But that integration with Bedrock allows us to do some pretty cool things. One is extend protection to kind of those Gen AI workflows, and the other is some kind of forensics and policy recommendations that we can do. So the first that we could do, we, we can kind of take this same flow, and to be candid, as long as you're giving us access to the storage services, S3, EBS, EFX, we can protect that data regardless of the application that's using it. But one thing that our customers are doing is as they're starting to kind of spin up Gen AI and use some of those foundational models, there's a need to say, well, I need to make sure that the data is clean in those models. Uh, and we've had some interesting conversations with customers using very well-known models, but again, because they're coming from a third party, they've taken kind of like a zero trust approach to that and said, we need to scan that data. So if you've played with like Bedrock or SageMaker, you know that you can kind of tune your models. And again, the storage services that you're just using underneath that are all the storage services that you're using today. So in S3, we can make what we call kind of a custom model bucket. The, the, the process kind of follows the same, but as it moves from kind of a staging to that custom model, we're removing all the threats or even the sensitive data just to make sure that your model is clean and that you can kind of tune it with what you have. The other kind of workflow that we see a lot with our customers is we call this kind of the output scenario. Very similar approach. The only thing is you're kind of starting with the Gen AI services a little bit earlier in the pipeline, where this is, you've, you've got your model, you've tuned your application, now you're outputting maybe some chat, maybe some text, or some kind of contextual information, and you need to make sure that that is free of sensitive data, that there's no personal identified uh, information in there, or you just want to secure the, the output of the prompts to make sure that it's kind of sanitized with what your application should be doing. Very, very similar approach. Again, very kind of same workflow that we're doing. The only difference is that staging kind of goes to the kind of the output side of the Gen AI application, and then the output bucket again can go into your, uh, to your application. So it's been nice because of the flexibility that we built We've been able to kind of modularize this approach uh, to Bedrock and SageMaker, and it's been phenomenal. It's, you know, for a company that started out saying, we're just going to help customers protect their data, it's been great to have kind of this huge wave of Gen AI adoption. And for us, because we've taken this kind of distributed approach to adapt our solution to work in these environments. So it's been some long nights coming up with some of the adaptations that we had to do, but it's been great to help customers secure those environments. The other great thing that we were able to do with Bedrock was we really looked at, you know, how do we take advantage of just Gen AI in our product ourselves? And as we talked with customers, there were kind of common questions we would always get when they would find malicious code in their environment. You know, the first was, well, what does it do? Uh, what do I need to do to solve it? And, and the other was like, you know, how confident are you in that that is a malicious file? The other kind of scenario that we would run into is like, hey, I, I have a lot of sensitive data. I, I appreciate we have kind of these pre-canned policies that look for things like you know, social security numbers, credit card numbers, all the kind of common things you hear, but I have some intellectual property uh, or I have something that's very specific in my application. Those, those are the types of patterns that I needed to do. So you know, the, the bread and butter of doing that is regular expression, but if you're familiar with regular expression, you know it's, it's pretty clunky. Like there's a lot of symbols and stars and it looks sometimes like a foreign language there. So it's hard to really kind of understand how to craft that policy. So when we looked at Bedrock, we were able to really kind of take advantage of these two use cases. So the first thing that we did, maybe a little bit hard to see, we call this kind of our malware analysis report. 
It's where we come up with a, a file or an object that's been identified as malicious. Through that bedrock integration, again, all contained within your account, we have engineered some prompts that go out, go, goes out to the instance of bedrock and says, hey, what is this file and what is it doing? You, you, it's a little hard to see here, but you can kind of see we've come back with a verdict from our different engines, Clam AV, CrowdStrike, as well as Sophos. They've given you kind of like, hey, here's what this file does. But we've also been very specific with these engines to say, hey, if you're not sure, don't do wild guesses. You know, make sure that you're very specific on what this is. And then it's coming up with kind of a, a recommendation piece. This has been really nice. Because again, it gives a customer more of like a verdict approach rather than yes, we think this is bad, trust us, we're the experts. You can get more of kind of a, a higher confidence rating of what that is. And then again, kind of the remediation piece. Built into our product, so again, all it will do is actually spin up an instance of Bedrock, send over those details, all contained within your environment. So a great integration that we were taking advantage of. The next thing that we looked at again was regular expression. How do we help our customers with regular expression? Now there are, you know, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of Google pages out there. You could look that up if you wanted to do a policy. But we looked at, you know, how do we decrease the time that a customer can understand what the policy is to create? So here I've created kind of a basic one. I'm looking for sensitive data. Uh, I'm just looking for, you know, a, a, a rule that's going to identify any email addresses. Uh, if that were, for whatever reason, you know, sensitive to me. What this will do then, again, with that same integration, we'll send that prompt to Bedrock, and Bedrock comes back with a nice little output of like, here is the policy that you would actually do. So you can probably appreciate kind of the complexity of what is regular expression. But then it also kind of gives you a breakdown of what each of those chunks of that policy is doing, and kind of the parameters that within that and some of the things that can uh, change like between maybe IP addresses or domains. Again, completely integrated within the stack, you're making that call within your AWS environment, it's not leaving out. And so it's been great. We've had some really, really great uh, success with these and had some phenomenal feedback sessions from our customers. So that's kind of the, the, the high level components of what we do. Again, there is so much more that we do at Cloud Storage Security. So I would like to invite you to please come by our booth. We're over at 703, just over kind of by the entrance. Uh, come by to see a demo of our release. We also have uh, a raffle and I think the prize is an actual ship of theses, right? You actually get one, it's docked over here. So yeah, phenomenal. Imagine going home and showing your kids that, it would be great. But please come on by. We also have a marketplace trial, uh, free 30 days. You can spin that up. And uh, I think that's it for our session. So thank you very much, I appreciate the time.